if all has gone to plan <laughs> with this filming setup, I don't think you'll be able to tell. I'm hoping you wouldn't be able to tell that it's currently Saturday night. <laughs> it's literally pitch black outside. Um, and it's a wild one, let me tell you. I'm here in the living room. I've got myself a little chamomile tea and my big Saturday night plans are to sit here and chat to you about books. Sounds like a real good time to me. <laughs> I think a nice hot drink of your choice is a bit of a prerequisite for this one. Let's get comfy, let's get cozy, pull up a chair. I was gonna say put the heating on, but in this economy. Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. How is it going? I hope you're doing really well. How are you? How's things? I hope life is treating you kindly. I am back again with one of my, maybe actually my ultimate favorite videos to film. I love sitting down to do these ones. This is the latest installment of everybody's favorite serial drama, to be or not TBR. And in a less shiny nutshell than that snappy title, um, it's basically time for us to have a chat about five books I've read recently, for me to tell you all about them, and for me to tell you honestly whether I think you should add them to your TBR pile or whether I think it's an enormous swerve. <laughs> also, if you do enjoy this sort of content and you want more book stuff from me, sorry, I'm, I just do this when I'm like thinking and talking, so I'm sorry if you can hear that in the microphone. If you would like more book content from me, you can follow me over on Goodreads, on Storygraph, on Instagram, and they will all be linked in the description box down below. Anyway, we have got a really mixed bag <laughs> for today's to be or not TBR little book pile. We've got witches, we've got spookiness, we've got a memoir, we've got a love triangle, and we've got pretentious Shakespearean scholars all while I'm three coffees deep. <laughs> now that's what I call a party. One. Today we are starting off with a book that as soon as I picked this off my shelf, I was like, why has this been sitting on my shelf unloved for such a long time? Why has it taken me so long to read this? Why have I never read this before? So this little beauty, this is Practical Magic by Alice Hoffman. And yes, this is the book of the iconic film starring Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman, who in that particular film has my absolute hair of beyond my wildest dreams. And if I did not have a ginger boyfriend and it wouldn't make us look like a very strange brother and sister, I would have copied that hair many, many moons ago. <laughs> I am a huge lifelong Practical Magic fan. I think I probably know that film off by heart. Um, but having said that and having got very excited about that fact, it's kind of irrelevant anyway, to be honest, because the book Practical Magic is completely different. I think they must have just kind of used it as a springboard, basically. They've seen kind of the premise and used the book as a springboard to create a great film. It focuses a lot more on the normal, normal elements of the characters and their development as they grow up and their story of moving from like kids to teenagers to adults and the romances that they find along the way rather than the big kind of dramatic Hollywood witchiness of it all. The magic is sort of like a nice little footnote to the story, whereas the film is obviously very kind of Halloween-y. But nevertheless, having said that, I still absolutely loved this book. Although I do think this was probably a bit of an easy win with me. Like Alice Hoffman had it in the bag when it comes to this one. Anything cozy, witchy, autumnal, magical, I'm in my happy place. And this is just the most kind of perfectly magical, uncanny, senses tingling, perfect autumn winter read. We have two sisters, we have Sally and we have Gillian who become orphaned. So they are raised by their aunts. And the aunts have got a bit of a reputation in the neighborhood for being a little bit spooky, something just not quite right about them. Honestly, I think all I want in life is just to be known as the spooky weird lady in the street. I think that might be my ultimate life goal. I feel like maybe one more cat and I'm there. So while Sally and Gillian are growing up at their aunt's house, they see woman after woman coming to visit their aunts to ask for special help in their love lives. And the girls vow that it'll never be them. They vow together that they will never fall in love. They will never let men break their hearts. They will never be that desperate to make a man fall in love with them. But obviously times change and Gillian grows into a bit of a wild child and she runs away to explore the world. While Sally stays, but she can't help but fall in love with a lovely local carpenter and they have two daughters together. And Sally tries her best to raise her two daughters with a normal life, away from where nobody knows their slightly unusual family 
family history. But trouble manages to find her anyway in the form of her wayward sister, Gillian. The tone of this book, the way this is written, could not be more perfect to the type of story that is being told. The way Alice Hoffman writes, it reminds me of almost like a grown-up fairy tale because it's quite hard to explain. It's got this kind of soft, very gentle, quite like sweet flow. Everything just feels very kind of pretty and a little bit ethereal and it's so evocative. It really kind of lights up your senses while you're reading it and honestly from the first page I was completely in love with this style of writing. And it's certainly not because it's particularly action-packed or exciting and it, you know, it's not keeping you on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen next. It's actually quite a slow paced story, I would say, but it's simply because the style of writing and the way it describes the subject matter is so immersive. I honestly just found it completely enchanting. I feel like the cover will give you like a real sense of that kind of like fairy tale kind of vibe with a little bit of a dark edge to it. It's got this kind of dark comedy edge as well to it, which I just enjoyed so much. I literally wanted to sink into this world and really be a part of it. Like I wish I lived within this book. I would honestly say the first sort of chunk of this book, maybe like 30, 50 pages or so, is my perfect story. It's absolutely perfect. It loses it a little bit as it meanders along and goes further into the story because it moves more away from the women in witchcraft kind of vibe and moves further into the story and the relationships and the romances. It's really fun, it's short, it's sweet, the characters are wonderful and I want to read the rest of the Alice Hoffman books now actually. Talking about this again has reminded me how much I want to read the rest of her stories and obviously also it really made me want to watch the film again. So this is definitely a sparkly little TBR. Please excuse me while I have a quick tea break. It's still hot, we're good. Okay, I don't think it's any kind of secret that I am a fully fledged member of the Stacey Halls fan club. The other two books of hers that I have read, The Familiars and The Foundling. I've talked about both of them on here before and I absolutely devoured both. I think she is such a good storyteller and I particularly love the kind of like ye olde Northern England type settings that she goes for. I don't think they're really classed as ye olde, they're not quite that old, but they're all set in the north. But those two kind of slightly mystical, magical, at times like a little bit kind of creepy, gothic -y vibes, historical women's fiction, yummy. I mean, throw in a green cover with a little bit of gold embellishment, you got me real good. So when this one came out, this is Mrs. England, this is her third book. I think um, this was an instant TBR for me, like an instant purchase. And I was super excited for this. So this one is set in 1904 in West Yorkshire. And Ruby May, our main character, is a newly graduated nurse. And she's taken on a position to look after the children of Charles and Lillian England. They're a very wealthy couple and they're from like a powerful kind of dynasty of mill owners, which up in the North of England at that time was a pretty big deal. So it's a very prestigious job, but they live in a very isolated house. What's it called? It had a great name, Hardcastle House. Love it. It's very isolated in the middle of nowhere and life in this job isn't quite what Ruby May thought it was going to be. Because when she starts working there, it very quickly becomes clear that there is something not quite right about the very mysterious Mrs. England. That's your title. She's beautiful, but she almost kind of passes around the house like a ghost and it's all very mysterious and everybody wonders what what's going on here? The characters in this book are great and it's one of those where you just know that every single person involved is loaded up with secrets and you're gonna discover them all. I really loved Ruby May. I thought she was a great character. She was a little bit like slightly hopeless at times, <laughs> like a little bit naive, but I, I think she probably would be. So she was great to get to know. I thought all of the characters were really strong actually. Stacey Halls is such like, really strong character-based storytelling. I always really like the characters. Um, Mr. and Mrs. England, they were just both slightly awful and quite scary, which is exactly what I'm looking for in this kind of book. So this book started out so strongly and literally from the get-go, I was like, yes, this is right up my street. This is amazing, more, more, more. But, unfortunately there's a but, as this started to unfold a bit more. I found that I was constantly reading this book with this feeling of like, okay, any minute now, 
the big thing is gonna happen. And unfortunately, that moment just never really seemed to arrive for me which is really sad. And it's funny because thinking back on it, the mystery itself was like dark enough and intriguing enough to keep me rolling along and keep me reading to the end. It kind of felt like the entire story was built on this really kind of delicious anticipation that something was gonna happen and there was gonna be some kind of really big, exciting, dark reveal, which never actually occurs. So as a reading experience, I did find this a bit unsatisfying. Like obviously there is a big explainer at the end and there is kind of a reveal to wrap things up. It definitely didn't give me the big satisfying read that I needed at the end. I'd say after probably about this much of the book, I was constantly just like, eh, 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 how about now? No, okay. <laughs> it was quite a slow pace with nothing major really happening apart from like, a bit of a veil of creepiness. Then the last 10% wraps up so quickly that it literally just kind of goes vroom and you're like, hang on, did I read that right? Are we done here? <laughs> so as you might be able to tell, unfortunately this one fell a little bit short for me, but then I always feel a bit guilty when I find that at the end of a book and I know I've gone into it with really high expectations, like have I anticipated this too much? Is this my own doing? Hoisted by my own petard once more. As I said, like I loved her last two books so much and both of those actually were topics that I'm really interested in. So maybe it was slightly inevitable that this one wouldn't quite match up to the high expectations that I was putting on it. It's a nice easy read. It's definitely really entertaining. Like don't get me wrong. There's definitely this like, quite yummy, delicious creepiness to it, which definitely carries through the story, but it never quite builds up to the spooky level that I was really looking for. So honestly, I would have to say, prioritize her first two books before this one goes on your TBR pile, TBH. Okay, something super different for my reading habits here, actually. Normally I am fiction, I'm fiction only, fiction to the bone, if I was a stick rock, slice me open and it'd say fiction all the way through it, do you know what I mean? But this is a memoir and it's also a concealed weapon that will leave you severely dehydrated from crying so much. Just a small warning to you there. If you are currently a little fragile, currently, you know, a little emotionally unstable, we've all been there. Maybe revisit this one at a later date. So this is Crying in H Mart, and this is by Michelle Zauner, who is the lead singer, I think, in a band called Japanese Breakfast. I know a lot of people actually recommend listening to their music while you're reading this, which is super fun and must make it quite like an immersive, cool experience. Saying that makes this sound a lot more fun than it actually is though, because this story is obviously Michelle's real life, it's her memoir, and it's about the time in her life where she discovers and lives through her mother's cancer diagnosis. So Michelle's mum wasn't exactly like the typical super maternal, like obvious outward displays of affection and love type of mother, um, but before they can kind of reconcile things and understand each other fully and repatch up their relationship. They're suddenly confronted by this terminal illness instead and have to come to terms with that together. So obviously this is an extremely sad read, but oh my God, this might be heartbreaking, but it is also such a wonderful book. I cannot say enough good things about this book. And it delves a lot deeper than just kind of dealing with her mother's illness as well. There's a lot more about identity for one thing, obviously the author's identity in particular as being a Korean American, and grappling with her feelings of not being white enough, but also not being Asian enough and what that means for her in terms of her life growing up and how that shaped her as a person. The part that I really, actually there were so many things that I really liked about this writing and this book. One part that I really liked and that I found so kind of comforting and heartwarming and strangely kind of wholesome. Actually wholesome is the wrong word. I think I just mean generally kind of, kind of like good for the soul. It's quite like nourishing writing, which is particularly fitting because this book talks a lot about food and how that can kind of act as a cornerstone, how food itself can be that feeling of home and how it can evoke so many memories and so much nostalgia and comfort, obviously, and how food and the act of cooking and it being kind of like a gesture of love to those around you, how that can really act as a bridge and a connection 
even without any words, like the the act of cooking for people is filled with so much care and so much compassion. It can really, you know, connect family members that are fundamentally very different people. And how the nostalgia that's tied in and all the memories that are tied in with certain foods um, kind of correlate with her grief as well. Honestly, the food moments in here and the descriptions of food, they're so good. They are su suitably chef's kiss. But despite being quite an emotional roller coaster, it's not a daunting book at all. It's very readable and very beautiful and you know there's a real feeling of love that you can feel through the pages the way the story is structured it's not like a a linear straight line here's how my life started here's what happened next here's what happened next here's what happened next it's almost more like little snippets of memory like little snippets of significant memory almost like vignettes of looking it through a window into somebody's life it's a very kind of precious private and personal collection of moments and I have so much admiration for the way that this just does not shy away. It's such a brave book. There's really nothing at all that's held back or sugar-coated or looked back on with rose-coloured glasses. It really confronts the kind of quite ugly, very unshiny parts of a mother-daughter relationship. It's honest about lots of things, but that in particular, and how that can often be something that is so dysfunctional, but also a love that is kind of incomparable and unlike anything else. And there's just these like pockets of loveliness, which kind of radiate from the pages um, and kind of really catch you off guard. When I went back to look at what I'd highlighted and kind of underlined in this one, it is all so deeply personal. I feel like I'm probably gonna sound a bit mad when I say this, but it almost feels wrong to say them all out loud. It feels wrong to kind of speak them out loud into the universe rather than just keeping them to yourself and kind of holding them in your hand, which is just a, a testament to the special writing, I guess. It feels like something that you should just enjoy for yourself and yourself only. Also, I would probably cry. It'll really make you want to hug your mum. I feel like this will be a tough read for many. Slightly less important, it will also make you really want some delicious Korean food. Absolutely a TBR if you are looking for something like this, if you're looking for something a little bit different to mix up your usual fiction. But just keep in mind, Ooh, it's an emotional experience. This is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This is a book with so much buzz around it. Also, I've just realized, this is why I leave the stickers on books. That's so gross. There's like sticker residue on it. I'd rather have the buy one, get one free. <laughs> this book, I read somewhere, don't quote me on this, but I read somewhere at some point that this is, if not the first, kind of one of the first books to be written by a trans woman to be picked up by one of the five major publishing houses. So it's a pretty big deal. Definitely a milestone in the book world and the publishing world, I guess. And it felt like an important book to me that was calling to be read. I was very intrigued. And this is always pitched. I wanna say, is it on the cover? It's always pitched either way as like a modern day sex in the city, which is a very catchy little line. And hey, it worked on me. So this book is about three characters whose lives collide in a pretty spectacular way. Our main character is Reese, who's a trans woman, and she's been living a, a pretty great dream little life for herself. She lives in New York City. She was in a relationship with her girlfriend, Amy. She had a pretty great job. They had a lovely apartment together, but then Amy detransitioned and became Ames, which sent everything spiraling. Everything's kind of fallen apart for Reese. She finds herself back in really unhealthy patterns and making terrible choices, having affairs with married men, quite like dangerous high risk affairs with married men. Um, and everything's kind of fallen apart for her. And Ames, after detransitioning, finds that he's no longer happy either because obviously he's lost that relationship with Reese, he misses her, and he's kind of lost the only kind of real family that he had. It's a pretty sad turn of events, actually, and I was really, I had like a real soft spot for these characters. I was rooting for them so hard. And then, as if that wasn't enough to contend with, as if that wasn't enough drama, Ames's boss at work, who also happens to be his lover, oh, it's messy, it's real messy, because Katrina, the boss at work, then calls Ames to tell him that she's pregnant. So Ames, knowing that Reese was desperate for a child while they were together, suggests the perfect answer. Why don't the three of them 
co-parent the baby together. Uh, yeah, it's a wild ride. And also, can we just take a moment for how clever this title is? I didn't really get it until I was reading the book. I was like, oh, detransition baby. But actually it's like, detransition baby, but also detransition baby. It's really all in the intonation. I think the general vibe for this story is chaos. <laughs> I think a lot of it will have lots of people clutching their pearls for dear life, like really holding onto those pearls. And I will openly admit that I learnt a lot while reading this book. It's a great book for opening your eyes about lots of different elements of trans womanhood and kind of exploring the shape of womanhood in general. It's something that I haven't really read a lot about before. I did a bit of Googling. <laughs> yeah, I definitely learned a lot about the trans experience while reading this. And I think that is probably my favorite takeaway from having read this because I think that's really important. And so much happens in this book that it probes into a lot of other quite interesting topics as well. Like obviously womanhood, but also motherhood and fatherhood and kind of the shape of parenthood in general, model of raising a child and how that can mean something completely different to so many people and toxic relationships and bringing your past into new relationships. There's loads of different interesting subject matter in here, but it is actually a very different story to what I was expecting. I kind of thought that the plot of this was gonna be the three of them raising the baby together. But in actual fact, it's more about what parenting means to each of the three characters. Actually, I would say there isn't really a whole lot of plot. It's definitely much more character driven. So if you're looking for something fast paced and funny, I mean, this is very witty. There's a lot of really kind of sharp, biting humor in it, but it's not that book. It's a lot more character driven than I was expecting. It does a lot of kind of meandering and the writing style does make it feel like quite a dense read at times. There's a lot of quite wordy, long sentences to be had in here. A lot of it's kind of very beautiful and witty and philosophical. Um, but it just depends what kind of writing style you like, I guess. I really liked the construction of all the characters in this book. They are certainly by no means likable at all times. As I said, there's a lot of messiness and chaos in this book and it's, it's really down to the characters' choices. Their life experiences are all so unimaginably difficult in so many different ways. So nobody in this book is making good decisions all the time and nobody remains likable throughout. Let's be honest, that's the way life works and other people's decisions always do look a bit questionable when you're on the outside making judgments about them, especially when it involves huge things like compromise or trying to reshape your life or, you know, construct your sense of self. When people are kind of trying to better their own life situation into something that feels more meaningful for them or, you know, to give them kind of the feeling of it's what they deserve. Big life decisions like that are always messy and questionable to people on the outside, but it's all nuanced. And that is just realistic human characters, I think. I was invested in all of them and I wanted the best for all of them. And I was really rooting for that happy ending, which you don't necessarily get. So the writing style is a bit wordy. Actually, there's kind of like time jumps and stuff in this, like the structure of this book and kind of like the pacing and the time jumps. I didn't necessarily love those, but it's so unique and it's fascinating and it's real and it's tough and it's brave and it's important reading, let's be honest. I think everyone should give it a try. I really do believe that every once in a while, every so often at least, we should be striving to read authors and read stories that are outside of our usual remit because doing that is only ever gonna further our understandings and our empathies to personal experiences that are different from our own. So yeah, it's a wild ride. Be prepared to be exposed. Be prepared to be called out of rawness and chaos and sex in some good witty writing with some really biting humor. I do now have a cat joining me as well. So there will be a tail floating around the vicinity. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flo. Great timing as always. Last but not least for today, here we have one of my most, what is that? More gubbins on my books. Was it you? Probably. Maybe one of my most anticipated reads ever. 
This is If We Were Villains by M. L. Rio. So this is always, without fail, in every list of like recommended dark academia books that you can possibly come across. It is always compared to The Secret History and it is always recommended as like ultimate autumn, winter, cozy reading kind of vibes. And that little trio combination is ticking three of my major boxes right there. This sat on my shelf for a little while because it almost felt like a little, felt like a little creepy treat that I was just saving for myself for a rainy day, you know? We've got Shakespearean aesthetics. We've got ridiculously intelligent higher learners. A secret society whose members communicate through slightly pretentious quotes We've got a secret gay love story bubbling underneath the surface. We've got young people doing morally questionable things at three o'clock in the morning on a winter's night. And you guessed it, we've got a brutal twisted murder thrown in for luck. What more could you possibly want? Oliver Marks has just served 10 years in prison for a murder that he may or may not have committed. Ooh, spooky. But he's just been released. And the day that he is venturing back out into the world, he is met by Detective Colborn. That is the man who put him in prison and 10 years later is now retiring. But before he leaves, he simply has to find out what really happened all those years ago. So way back then, Oliver was one of seven young actors who were all studying Shakespeare together at an elite arts college and who all kind of lived in each other's pockets. And these seven friends, they all take the same roles on stage as well as they do off stage. And I wrote these down to make sure I didn't forget any. We've got the main character hero. We've got the slippery villain. We've got the controlling tyrant, the sexy temptress, the intriguing ingenue, and the extra. Let me know in the comments, which one would you be? <laughs> but then when casting changes and the roles are reshuffled in fourth year and suddenly the usual secondary characters are now upstaging the stars, the status quo of their friendship is unbalanced and unsettled. And those very famous plays start to spill over into their real lives all of a sudden. And one of them is found dead. Oh, it's good. Even when I like explain this, as I'm explaining this now, and as I've told friends about it, I'm like, oh God, it's so good. I only wish I'd read this sooner. There's one particular quote, which I put in my notes here. You can justify anything if you do it poetically enough. Hell yes. So this isn't just like your straightforward run of the mill thriller, as well as being that kind of like dark, captivating murder mystery type vibe. Um, this is also, the thing that makes it a little bit different is that this is also a love letter to Shakespeare. So hey, stand up, all my English lit grads who've got terrible memories of forcing themselves through Henry IV. Can I get a whoop whoop? Can I get a high five? And kind of like the structure of the story itself is all very Shakespeare. Obviously it's written in like acts and stuff, but it goes further than that. The things that happen in certain chapters are quite reminiscent of the famous plays. There is lots of Shakespearean quotes like woven into the text and woven into the dialogue. Like these kids communicate through Shakespeare quotes. I loved it. I think some people would personally hate that and it would ruin a reading experience for a lot of people. And hey, if I knew anyone in real life who wove Shakespeare quotes constantly into conversation while I was just trying to tell them like about this really nice brunch that I had, I'd think they were a complete knob. But in this, it really works. In the context of this story, I really loved it. It adds so beautifully to the atmosphere of this story. And it is just amazing levels of knowledge that the author can weave this many kind of Shakespeare calls and quotes and references into a fresh story and mirror the events of an original story. It's so clever. It's just this kind of like great bitter irony all the way through. Obviously the, the stage is set in this book for the ultimate tragedy. But yeah, just as a little warning, I think you do have to have a little bit of love for old Shaky to enjoy this one. Otherwise it's gonna do your head in. I think quite often in dark academia books, the characters are not necessarily likable, but they're so kind of like, intensely rich. They're all really fascinating and shallow and pretentious and incredibly intelligent. They all stand in this very like morally gray area and have really complicated backstories that makes you second guess them. But they're so captivating. This kind of atmosphere of this book, I just find so captivating. I love their kind of ruthlessness and selfishness. And all of that together just creates this really like 
dark, rich, angsty atmosphere that basically had me by the throat from cover to cover. I think I mentioned earlier, the main thing that's ever written about this book is that it's just constantly compared to the secret history. And obviously you can totally tell why. It is a very similar kind of concept, a university setting, very similar kind of character tropes throughout, a weird creepy obsession with a particular era of literature that seeps into their daily lives, casual friendship group murder, the general vibe. There's a lot of things that are hand in hand between both books. But I would say this is a much kind of more digestible. I don't want to say lighter because it's still a really dark book, but it's a lot more digestible. Reading The Secret History, I would say, is kind of darker and a lot more kind of enveloping and it really sucks you in. Um, but it is a lot denser. It's a bit of a trickier read. This is a lot less daunting to pick up. Less daunting, equally haunting. Put that on the cover. And yes, it is slightly ridiculous, but it is all the delicious, dark academia, melodrama, moodiness, madness, that is kind of the way, do you know what I think about when I think about the reading experience of this book? I think of like a really dark, rich, dark treacle sponge cake. A sticky toffee pudding with a really dark treacle. That's how I describe reading this. It's thrilling, it's beautiful, it's Shakespearean nerdery, and it's also a debut imagine. It might not be for everyone, but if this is for you, it is so for you. I actually really want to reread this so that I can take it all in a lot more. I think when you read it for the first time, it's a little bit overwhelming with all the kind of Shakespeare quotes and stuff. I want to reread this and take it in a lot more. And that I don't reread stuff very often, if ever. So this is an absolute TBR every day apart from the ending which belongs in jail because it killed me. So there we go, that is my latest little batch of to be or not TBR. Definitely let me know in the comments if you have read any of these, what you thought about them, if you're going to be grabbing any of them for yourself to add them to your own TBR pile, and please do let me know what you've been reading recently and if you think there's anything in particular that I need to get for myself. I'm sure there probably is. Thank you guys so much for watching, I really appreciate it, I hope you're doing well, and I will see you very soon with another video. Bye!